Welcome. We're doing lecture six in the uh, Gospel of Matthew, and we're up to chapter 17 to 19. And what I want to do today is to look at three different things. From chapter 17, I'd like to look at the transfiguration. I'd like to look at most of the discourse on community from chapter 18. If you remember, this will be the fourth of our Lord's, or of the, of St. Matthew's rather, discourses. We had the Sermon on the Mount, which told us the, uh, the lifestyle of the kingdom. We had how to be on mission for the kingdom. Then we had the parables about the kingdom. Now we've got life within the kingdom, how to, how to live with one another in the kingdom, in community. Then the third thing I want to look at is the costly values of the kingdom from chapter 19. So first off, we'll have a go at the transfiguration. I guess most of us would know the story pretty well. Jesus takes three of his closest disciples, they go up Mount Tabor, and there he is transfigured. His face shines, his clothes shine and so on, and Moses and Elijah appear. The representative of the law, the Torah, the representative of the prophets appear. And then God's voice comes. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And I guess the way we were brought up, we looked upon that and, and preachers preached that this really is a psychological preparation for the disciples as they face Jesus' arrest and execution. Well, we're going to see it a little bit differently today. First off, though, a little word about Mount Tabor. We don't really know if it was Mount Tabor, um, but by the 4th century it became a fairly fixed tradition. There was the great bishop of Jerusalem, Cyril, who around the year 340, 345, something like that, said it's more than likely that the Mount of Transfiguration was Mount Tabor. And then this was supported by the great St. Jerome. And from those that time in the 4th century, we've always located the Mount of Transfiguration on Mount Tabor. It's a fabulous mountain. When you drive up it, you're taken up by a taxi, and that's the most frightening ride you'll ever be on because they, they go around corners at breakneck speed and all of that. But once you arrive at the top, the scene there is just stunning. So it has a natural beauty about it. And the beautiful thing, of course, is that from early days we still have buildings, traces of buildings where Christians from generations have come to Mount Tabor to remember this extraordinary scene in the Gospel. Of course, as we, we uh, listen and watch this scene with the eyes of people from the Old Testament, we can see there are echoes of Moses going up Mount Sinai when he's going to meet God, when he's going to receive the Ten Commandments from God. Moses takes with him some companions. Moses' face is going to shine quite brilliantly. So that's a little bit in our background. And also we'll, we could remember that both Moses and Elijah, they're the two people in the Old Testament who are closest to God. They see God. They go up a mountain, both of them, to see God. And they experience on the mountain God's presence, a theophany, an appearance of God. When Moses receives the Ten Commandments and when Elijah is there waiting for God. And remember, God is not in the the great fire of the wind, God is in the beautiful, gentle breeze. Two very powerful scenes that are 
the uh, background, if you like, for this extraordinary scene in the New Testament. So now we're going to ask, what's it all about? If we remember, at right at the beginning, we have the phrase, six days later. Six days after what? Well, we've had Peter confess that Jesus is the Messiah. And then, when uh, that's been acknowledged by Jesus, he starts to talk about what sort of a Messiah he is. He predicts his passion. And Peter says, <laughs> no, you're not going to do it. So they've probably been thinking about this for six days. What's that all about? We know who he is, and he's going to suffer. So what's all this about? And now, one of the commentators says that the transfiguration is God's confession of who Jesus really is. So in a sense, we're suddenly having the veil lifted between heaven and earth. And for a a moment or two, we have Jesus as he truly is. The whole Jesus, human and divine. And as we, of course, watch this scene, we, we go right back to the baptism of Jesus. When the heavens open, a voice is heard, This is my Son, the Beloved, in whom I am well pleased. And here, though, we have a phrase added. Listen to him. Watch him. This is crucial. This is so important to understand what God's about. Because the truth is that my beloved son is the one who's going to suffer. So what Peter didn't understand now God is confirming, is confessing, is revealing to us, this is reality. This is how it is. God's ways aren't our ways. This is a most extraordinary insight into this. And if we're going to understand what God is like, we've got to hold together the truth that each of us is God's beloved son or daughter, incredibly loved as Jesus was and yet we're not going to be foreigners to suffering so somehow or other we're going to know suffering backwards in a sense as Jesus did but that's going to be our pathway into resurrection so for us suffering isn't a counter against being God's beloved son or daughter. But somehow or other, the mystery of who we are, both are there. And could I just add a, a little word about this question of Elijah, as they're coming down the mountain and talking about Elijah. Elijah will come back, yes, that's the general belief of Jewish people at the time of Jesus, and he's going to restore all things. Well, John the Baptist Jesus says, began that whole thing. Yes, he is Elijah returned in a sense. And the restoration is really beginning. And of course it will be through me that the restoration really gets going. And I guess as, we're, as he's saying this, he's thinking, we're thinking, well look what happened to John the Baptist. There's a hint then of what's going to happen to Jesus. So, in this extraordinary scene of the transfiguration, we, we, we've got an insight, really, into what life's about, what God's ways are, and how this beloved Son of God, Jesus, will know the mystery of suffering. But that's the pathway into resurrection. So transfiguration is an extraordinary scene for St. Matthew. Now can I do the second thing, and that is, we're going to have a little bit of a look at some of the key factors in any community. 
And this is the great fourth discourse in St. Matthew's Gospel. I guess if we had to say it in two, two or three words, we'd say little children, the little ones, and forgiveness. They're key in our life as church. They're key in any parish. Those two realities, little children or the little ones, and forgiveness. So let's have a look, a little bit of a look at this now. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who really is greatest in this kingdom? How do we get into the kingdom? Jesus changes us a little way, a little bit. How are we going to get into the kingdom? We're going to get into the kingdom if we don't worry about power. If we're into power, we're sort of, we're, we're blind to what the kingdom's about. We, we can't even understand what the kingdom is. In the ancient Near East, children were non-persons in a sense. They were lovable, as any parent loves their child, but socially they were insignificant. They were nobodies socially. And so when Jesus says, unless you become like children, in a sense he's not saying, unless you become childlike, you have the wonder of children or you have their trust or whatever. It's not so much that. It's rather, unless you have the, uh, the lack of power of children, unless you understand that, you're not going to find the kingdom. So we've got to, in a real sense, have a, a sense of humility about us, uh, knowing who we are and being comfortable about who we are and not go after status and power in the kingdom. Our will to be great, to be noticed, needs a bit of curbing. That's, that's what this is all about. Now, if I could just add a little bit on scandalising the little ones. And that's become very important with sexual abuse in the church. And that's, that's the literal meaning, um, of course. And, and it's better for a, a millstone to be tied around our neck and thrown into the sea um, if we're scandalising somebody, some, some of those little ones. And, and that's used, this text is used, of course, in a whole debate on sexual abuse of children, pedophilia and all of that, with good reason. Because we know, as we've never known before, what damage we can do to little ones, um, sexually, psychosexually, but also to the whole idea of faith and love and trust and all of those things. So with good reason we've taken that text in that literal sense. But we've also got to understand that Jesus really meant it as, again, as the little children are the little ones, meaning people who are not into power, but the ordinary people. People who we would class as perhaps simple, not simple-minded, of course, but just average, ordinary people. We cannot ever scandalise them. What does that mean? Well, it means, as the scripture scholars tell us, that all people have their own way to God. And we can't act in a superior way to people who perhaps their way to God is a little bit simplistic, perhaps. And for us today, that becomes a big question because some people love simple devotions, other people love a spirituality of the heart, which goes perhaps a little deeper. Other people love meditation, contemplation, which is perhaps a, a greater goal even still. But there can be no sense of superiority and no sense of ridicule. Once we do that, once we say, my way is better than your way, my devotion is superior to yours, that's exactly what will cause scandal and upset and hurt 
and the Lord doesn't want that. There are many ways to God. So the the most uh, pastoral way is to be accepting and affirming of everybody in their way to God. Of course, being careful if it's bordering on superstition or uh, lacking orthodoxy and all of that, and at times we need to step in, but in general, the general principle is don't scandalise anybody in their approach to God. Don't act in a superior way. Don't ridicule them. And then a little bit on the lost sheep. Go after the lost sheep. It's uh, always been a bit of a... It's always been pretty important to me because when I was back in the parish in Adelaide, there was a fabulous former priest, Scottish, wonderful man, and he'd always come up to me and say, what are you doing about the lost sheep? You know, so it's always... Yeah. The 99, they're there, and that's... Marvellous, we, we thank God for that, but we, we're called to go after the one that's lost. And from Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 16, I will seek out the lost, I will bring back the stray. That's God speaking. And that's, of course, as Jesus saw things too, and that's, of course, as we try as a community to see things as well. God never gives up on the marginalised or the lapsed. Never, ever gives up. And if we're a real community, a real community, we can never give up on the marginalised and the lapsed. I'm reminded of um, a little parrot, a little nursery rhyme. Little Bo Peep has lost her sheep and doesn't know where to find them. Leave them alone and they'll come home, dragging their tails behind them. If we, pro- if we say that about the church, it's not true. Leave them alone. They'll eventually come back to Mass or to the church. Will they? If we're Bo- a Bo Peep church, that's what we'll believe. But we're the church of the Good Shepherd. We're the church that goes out after the lost sheep. And that's a massive challenge to all of us. So if we're content just with who we are, and we haven't got a sense of reaching out and trying to bring others back in, we're a little bit like Bo Peep. Sorry about that. (laughs) Now this next thing is, uh, so that's the little ones, basically. And the second thing I just want to say a word about is forgiveness. Now, this is an extraordinary thing, how central forgiveness is to community life. Of course, and this is, um, this is the, the, the community of Matthew, every community has to have structures of dealing with conflict and of dealing with when somebody just shouldn't be allowed, we always talk about a rotten apple and all that, but it's true in a community, we have to deal with people that are really destroying the community. So, Jesus gave the um, binding and loosing, he gives that to the community. He gives us the power to deal with difficult situations, even to excommunicate. We know that means to ask a person to no longer come to the community. As we understand it, as Catholic Christians, to come to Holy Communion. It's the same thing, really, but for us at the heart of community life is going to Holy Communion. Community, communion. It's central for our spirituality. Central for us. So the early church, too, after St. Matthew, developed structures for dealing with people who we believed had really cut themselves off from who we are. And they were people who were apostate, who had actually declared openly they were no longer Christians, or they were adulterers. And back in that society, that just destroyed family life more than it does today. Or they were murderers. And they joined a group in the church called 
the penitents, the penitentes. So you had the faithful, the penitents, and the catechumens, three classes of people in the early, in the early church. And the penitents were the ones that were coming back, being reconciled back into community. So we developed it just as the early Jewish Christian church of St. Matthew developed. That's a natural thing to have. To deal with the difficult situation, but the will is always reconciliation. So, now that's the bigger issue, the smaller issue, but it's not a small issue. It is, how often should I forgive my sister or brother if they, if they offend me? Well, if we're counting, we haven't forgiven, have we? If we're calculating, that's not the name of the game. And it's a crucial thing to community. It's crucial. I'll never forget, you know, I, I studied St. Augustine. I love St. Augustine. I read all his homilies. And when he's talking to the people of his parish, um, he says the three, the three things that he really complains about all the time, or not complains about, but challenges people on, uh, getting drunk, visiting prostitutes, and holding grudges, not forgiving. Now you sort of think, oh yes, I can see the other two, but not forgiving is up there with them. Because when we're, we're, when we're not forgiving, we're not free. We're not open to the kingdom. So Jesus sees it as crucial. And in, in our experience of life, I think we do know it's crucial. When we can't forgive, we know we're blocked. We're not free. We, we understand that from our experience of life. And so we're called into what some people say is a forgiving lifestyle. That's where the people that don't hold grudges, where the people that our hearts are open with compassion, trying to forgive. Now, of course, there will be things that happen in our life where we're hurt or damaged or whatever, and forgiveness is hard. And that's a massive journey. But it's the journey we know to be free, we all have to take. Now the 70, 7 times 7 is probably taken from Genesis chapter 4, verse 24, where this Lamech has this, this poem about, um, about how he... Um, a man wounded him, so he killed him. A boy hit him, so he killed him. Dreadful, most dreadful. And it was that the that violence in the world is getting worse and worse and worse. And so the, there's a phrase in that, if Cain is avenged seven times, truly Lamech 77 times. So, so that phrase is lifted from there and placed on Jesus' lips. That's how often we must forgive, which is... Limitless, of course. And then we have the parable of the king. Now, this king must be a Gentile king because Jewish law forbade the sale of a, a wife and goods to, to repay a debt. Now, I suppose the biggest thing in this story is how the... the the talents, the, the innumerable talents, and then the petty forgiveness. Not Well, it's a couple of months' work. But if you look at the story itself, um, and you see how many talents there are, it's something like, if my mem I've got a 10,000 or something. Now, um, 10,000 it is. Now, do you know what? 10,000 is extraordinary because King Herod the Great, who had all this property, if the annual income was only 900 talents. So 10,000 is just unbelievable sum of money. What does that mean, really? It means something like this, and I'll read this from a wonderful writer. It says, Those grasped by the kingdom, 
must realize the sea of divine forgiveness in which they have been plunged. Now, that to me says it all. We're in a, a one, we're, we're blessed and constantly blessed to know we're forgiven. And God's mercy is everywhere. There's no sin that's not forgivable. And to have that sense deep within us of the freedom of the children of God is a most wonderful thing in this world where people are burdened by guilt and burdened by memories of things they've done and all of that. So we've got to absolutely know that what God wants is mercy, not sacrifice. We're ever merciful, ever compassionate. If we're to reflect the kingdom, that's how we are. That's how, that We can't help but be anything but that. We're not into unforgiving attitudes at all. So that's the extraordinary thing about that particular parable. And now just a few words. Uh, I'll move on to the third thing, and I won't uh, spend much time here. What we're looking at now are the costly values of the kingdom. We've seen some of the beautiful things about the kingdom, but it takes a bit from us. We, we have to give, and it's, it's, it's costly, the kingdom. So, the first thing is, there's the new vision of family. And so we'll look a tiny bit at divorce, and a tiny bit uh, at being eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. Now, once we can get to this question of divorce, Matthew changes Mark's question slightly by adding. Now, Mark's question is, is it against the law for a man to divorce his wife? Matthew adds, on any pretext whatsoever. So there's a slight sh shift into are there any grounds for divorce, really? What are the grounds for divorce? So it's not just looking at what the law says. It's what do you think? And, what's, and then Jesus goes into this extraordinary thing and says, quoting Genesis, from the beginning. If you look at how God means it, God's will for us in creation, not just from any culture, the Jewish culture or whatever culture, but if you look at what God's will is for the human family, it is that there won't be divorce. This is the ideal, of course. We must understand that. Uh, the ideal is, from God means it from the beginning, that there will be a man and a woman faithful to each other. And that that's the original vision. And then faithfulness to each other is a sign of the kingdom. Faithfulness is a sign of God's kingdom. So it is rather beautiful. Of course, we're not going to go into it here, but we know that reality means that the ideals we have sometimes bump up against difficult, challenging situations. And the Lord knows that too, as we saw in the Sermon on the Mount. But just here, he's talking about the ideal. Eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. Well, here he's really talking about, you know, it is possible for somebody to be so caught up with this treasure found in the field, this pearl of great price, that they can devote their whole life to that. That's all. That's what he's saying. And then the final thing about these... Uh, families is about children and here we see that in Matthew's community children have a special place which is a little bit unlike the synagogue because synagogues had a place for women upstairs and male children under 12 had no place nor did girls or young women it was mainly older women 
So in a sense, the synagogue wasn't overly family friendly, whereas the Matthews community and Christian communities were very family friendly. And of course, we baptize children. We baptize whole families. So for, as, as little babies, we baptize them. So in a real sense, we had a, a strong conviction that all of us, no matter what age, are open to God's grace. And we're all part of the community. And now just to end on the rich young man. And I will only say a word about this, but this is a text which has influenced so many people that they've given up so much to follow Jesus. And one of the first to do that when he was at church listening to this text was Anthony of Egypt. And eventually he became the first monk, the first Christian monk, and an extraordinary man. He sold his, he sold his possessions. His mum and dad had died. He's reasonably wealthy. He looked after his sister. And then he just moved more and more into the hermit's life of just living for God because he heard this text. Now, the, I just like to say one or two little things about it. If you want to be perfect, go da 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 da. Perfect in this sense means if you want to be whole, if you want to be un, your heart undivided, if you want to be fully, fully mature, well then go and sell now. What Jesus probably means is not necessarily everything you own, but whatever's stopping your heart from being free. That's what he's probably saying. Okay, now this guy, this young wealthy man, leaves sad because he's a man of great wealth. And the opposite of that is having the joy of the kingdom. And it's only those who can sort of see the pearl of great price and want it, the treasure hidden in the field, go after it, and can somehow or other incarnate all that into their lifestyle, that are going to have the joy of the kingdom. So we've looked a little bit of in this at the, at the importance of children, at the importance of marriage, and at the importance of letting go of whatever's stopping our heart from being undivided and following Jesus as best as we can, wholesomely, wholeheartedly. Thanks.